So, <clears throat> hello again. I hope that the uh, lunch was okay. I know, it was not too dry, not too soft. Everybody satisfied? Okay. Yeah. So, don't, I hope that you did not uh, overeat yourself, so uh, you, you, you don't fall asleep. But I, I'm sure that this uh, presentation would be um, fun enough that uh, it will keep you awake. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I will. Uh, we have uh, uh, our um, uh, presenter from Prodyna, and he will uh, he will uh, talk about uh, Neo4j and some of the, I guess, good practices. Um, so, uh, like uh, when you have a question, just to remind you again, go to Orange Tessy Bot on Messenger or Telegram. You have the links here, uh, and just push it through so uh, I will follow the questions and then I can uh, I can summarize the questions so everybody gets the biggest value and of course I invite you again please rate speakers love rating they love to show like that they're on the top of the list so please please do do rate um, and that's it like I'll let the stage please okay audio okay yeah, hello Belgrade. Um, my name is Darko Križić and today I'll be talking about um, Neo4j and how we are using it to handle complex data. And let's start with the expectations today. So if you have some end users, the require or the, the expectation for, from the end user side is that data is being updated in a real-time manner. And so when you get new data, it has to be available instantly. Second, everybody wants to search in a Google-like way. Nobody expects to have some semantical stuff. Just enter a few keywords, and the system must give you the correct answer. And um, in a second step, if you have some refinement of your queries, then semantics comes in. And when people add data to some IT system, they are not willing to edit metadata uh, manually. There is an expectation that the system must be able to extract the information automatically. And <clears throat> yeah, as I said, the semantical search is getting very important. And what are the challenges of today? First, we have something that we call data kingdoms. You have an IT landscape, different IT systems, not connected very good. And the information you're looking for is ho very often in between. And a second challenge is we have a lot of data. If you call it big data or not is a discussion topic, but it is a lot of data. And um, very often we have systems delivering us constant data, a stream of data. And this data needs to be processed and needs to be sorted in in, in our central, let's say, search. And data we have to handle with is often not very uh, perfect. Yeah? I talk about data quality. So data can be incomplete, data can be unprecise, but we still have the requirement to handle this data. And now the data we have, there are some relationships in between, and those relationships are getting more and more important. And one typical example is I have different data sources which are standing standalone. I would like to have some more overview of my data. And one challenge, we are using machine learning more and more often. Machine learning helps us a lot. But machine learning has a, let's say, a feature. If I detect information somewhere, the information always gives me some probability or some co um, confidence. How sure am I that this found information is what I'm looking for? And this gives us eno enough complexity, and we have to handle with this. So first, big data. We have a lot of data. And today, it's no problem to handle big data. If we have a mass of data, we can use technologies like MongoDB or Cassandra and simply store the data, find it quickly. So this is not a problem that we have to solve. It's solved already. Um, and we can also analyze huge amounts of data. We have um, things like MapReduce. MapReduce allows us to scale out maximum and have a real-time processing, a behavior of real-time processing. And we have machine learning, as I mentioned before. Machine learning becomes more and more important, and we can teach the system to find the information we are looking for. 
But it's not only the values in the data we need. We also need to take care about the relationships. So regarding managing data, in the last 15 years, we got about 200 new databases. So there is the old world of relational databases. And even if you, if you now have Oracle or DB2, they're all relational. They work the same. And then suddenly there was a bunch. And today we have uh, maybe even 250 completely new databases, like MongoDB, CouchDB, Cassandra, HBase, very powerful, very interesting databases. And if you take a look on those databases, you will find out that we have key value stores, we have white column databases, we have document stores, and we have something which is called graph databases. And those graph databases, in my personal opinion, is the most interesting kind of database that we have today, and they will become extremely important in the future. And therefore, today I will be talking about graph databases, and especially Neo4j, which is the most powerful implementation of graph databases. And to summarize this list, we have big data, MapReduce, machine learning. So what we do in different projects in our company, unfortunately, I cannot talk too much about the customers. But believe me, worldwide companies, and uh, we have to sign NDAs because those projects are extremely strategic. And the goal we often have is that companies have information in different IT systems, and they want to have an overview of the information they have. Just to give you an example, if you're a consulting company, you would like to know which customers do we have, which consultants do we have, who has worked ever in which project, which technologies did you use in a project, and when you later are looking for something like who had to do with this technology in this specific, um, let's say, um, transportation branch, you would like to have some information and you get this by connecting the data you have. So the goal is to put all data you have in a single graph. Yeah? The graph databases have graphs. And so you put in all facts and you have a process that keeps the graph always up to date in real time. So what we usually do is we create an architecture that looks like this. So we have source data. Source data can be anything. We extract this data. It can be a stream, like sensor data from a production plant. And we have some processing. Let's use things like Spark, SparkML, Kafka for transporting data, processing data, do machine learning. And so we extract information. And we write this result in a Neo4j graph database. And then we can add a presentation to it. So a presentation, the left screenshot shows uh, is Tableau. On the right side, this is a custom, custom application we have developed for a specific worldwide acting customer. By the way, this application was developed mainly here in Belgrade. And um, we also, just to add, um, the processor on top is also very interesting. If I create a graph and I have all my data and all my facts in this graph, I can use machine learning and find more information in the, in the data that I have in this graph. So a little bit basics about graph databases. Just a short question. Who have, who have ever of you heard about graph databases? OK, most. Who has worked with graph databases? OK, a few. OK, so it makes sense for me to talk now. Um, so the basic principle of graph databases is we have two, two kinds of data. First is a node, and second is a relationship. A relationship always connects two nodes. And um, a big difference, people ask me very often, what's the difference now between a relational database and a graph database? A graph database, the difference is relationships are a first-class citizen. So we have nodes and relationships, and both are, have the same value. And <coughs> excuse me, relationships, they have a direction, and they have a type. So if I have a relationship, you see on the right side, real-world application. You can see in this picture, in Germany, which is a country, we have a product which is called uh, Achat, which is based on a formulation which is sold as a hut. And there is this green dot is the so-called treatment or registration um, that this one allows the treatment of a specific disease called brown rust on crop growth stage number three on, uh, on wheat. And we also have a different product in a different country, but obviously they're based on the same formulation. And this is very easy visible. Yeah, a graph database can give us data which we can easily show as a graph. So it's easy for us to understand this data. And as you can see, the relationships, they are typed. So they tell us something like uh, this is sold or this is uh, in a country or um, this is using something. 
And relationships not only have a type, they also have properties. So I have a list of key value pairs which are stored in the relationship. So again, those relationships are very important and contain a lot of information. And also, I can have an unlimited, unlimited number of relationship between two nodes. It can be the same two nodes, but also to any other node. So I can express a lot of detail in my data using those relationships. And this basically very simple model, nodes, relationships, both have properties, is the superior uh, superior data storage model to any other database technology that we know today. My personal opinion, if somebody is, has a different uh, meaning, come to me and let's discuss it. Um, so it's superior to any relational database model. So it's no problem for me, take over an old application, which is relational, take it over to the graph database and continue working with the same data. Hierarchical data, which is a hierarchy, is nothing else than a special case of a graph. And then things like an ontology. Ontology is a node having multiple parents, is a special case of a graph. It's a so-called directed graph. So everything we have in data can be mapped easily to a graph database, and therefore is a superior modeling uh, structure. Just a small example of a little bit of data, how it looks like in the graph database. So for example, we have persons and groups. Yeah, we have some guys and we have some sports activities like climber, biker, surfer, and um, a diver. And um, what I can see is that, for example, Klaus is a sponsor of climbers. So I have a relationship de defining what's his role to this group. And one example is Dirk is also a climber, he's a member of, and also this, he sponsors this group. So I have multiple relationships telling me different details about the facts I have. And you see, I clicked on this relationship called member of, and I can see his activity is 50, meaning he is 50% active in this group. And uh, there's another property telling me since when he is active in this group. So this relationship, I repeat, is a major modeling string, uh, thing in graph databases. Now let's go a little bit into a practical example. This comes from our customer. There is a small ontology, or in this case, a hierarchy of structures I have in documents. And in the practical world, this yellow nodes, we have millions of them. You must imagine the whole world is, a, is separated in millions of, of things that are, have a relationship to each other. So in the top node, you can see we have a chemical. And chemicals can be vitamins, and vitamins can be vitamin B, and vitamin B can be vitamin B6 or vitamin B12. And um, then we have, on the other side, we have liquids, and liquids can be, in this very simple case, oil or water. And now we have documents. We, we have taken existing documents, old documents. We have run them through an OCR. We have um, done a structure recognition of chemical structures. And then we, have point, we are now pointing with our documents to the, um, to the correct nodes. And those relationships also have a probability, which might be 90%, 80%, 100%, depends. And now, let's have a real-world example. And that's uh, what I mean with semantical. We are now looking for a specific kind of document. We are looking for a document, let me just take a look, which handles vitamin B12. It's a stabilization. How can I stabilize vitamin B12 against oil? And you can see we have documents about vitamin B6, uh, or here, vitamin B6 and oil. We have water against uh, vitamin B6, but there is no document that gives us what we want. And if you compare, if you have a full-text search engine, it also doesn't know vitamin B12, vitamin B6. Yes, both contain word vitamin, but how similar are they? And, and in, our, um, in our hierarchy, we can see Vitamin B12 and vitamin B6 are both vitamin B, so they are very close, they are just two hops away. And exactly this feature is what we are now using for searching the document. So what I'm doing here, is it readable on the, on the seats? Can you read behind? Yeah? So this on, on the top, this is the query language of Neo4j. It's called Cypher. Uh, everything in the Neo4j world has to do with the movie Matrix. 
Um, so f in the first step, I'm looking for a structure called vitamin B12. And then I'm also looking for oil, which is another structure. And then I'm looking for a document that contains any structure. And then I'm, taking, I'm uh, using this document. I, I'm looking for structure S0 and S1. So I have taken my document with two structures. And then in the next step, I'm doing a path search. I'm telling Neo4j, please find I mean, I'll point this with my mouse, sorry. So I am, can you see the mouse? Sorry. Yeah. So here I have, I'm looking for a path from the structure zero that is part of my document. And I'm telling Neo4j, go from there to vitamin B12, which I'm looking for. And the distance can be zero to two. So I'm looking not only on the node the document is connected to, but also looking in the graph for nodes around it, and then I'm limiting it to two. It can be five, it can be unlimited, no problem. And I'm doing the same with oil. I'm taking the second structure here and looking for the distance to oil. And the result is a path. Neo4j can return a path to me, telling this from this node to this node, there is a path in between. And um, yeah, then I'm calculating the sum of the path length. And this is very important to me. If the path length is zero, I have a full match. But um, the, the smaller the number, the more exact my answer is. And now take a look on the result. The first result tells me document two is our candidate. It uh, handles vitamin B6 and it handles oil. So vitamin B6 is not a full match, but if I take a look on the first path, it, I see vitamin B6 is also a vitamin which also contains vitamin B12. So we have a node distance of two. And on the right side, I see oil is a full match. So I have a length, a total length of two. So what I can do now technically is the user is searching for vitamin B12 and oil. But here I can tell them, look, I don't have vitamin B12, but I have vitamin B6. It's similar. Maybe this document is of interest to you. And another match would be document one. Document one talks about vitamin B12, but against water. So again, I have a path. And again, the length is uh, two. So those two documents are no full matches, but very interesting for the user because from a chemical perspective, they are similar, so they ca could be applied. Yeah? We are in the field of researchers working with chemical structures and processes. And then number three, um, as you can see in the, the order by length ascending. Yeah? Therefore, I get the documents in this specific order. And then document number three tells me Length is four because both entities I have found are also neighboring with two nodes to my uh, nodes I'm looking for. So the, what this practical example shows us, I can put my facts in a graph database and um, I can use the graph for having a semantical distance and I can offer the user a very, very powerful search that has a lot of value for the end user because in my IT system, I know that a distance is also the similarity of two chemical structures. So what are we using this for? Um, one thing is master data management, product management, data quality, fraud detection, very interesting topic. Strategy, now I have an example for this. Routing, condition monitoring, business analytics, and the mentioned, already mentioned knowledge graph. So let's come back to the term data kingdoms. What is a data kingdom? So we have some IT landscape, and there is one kingdom. It's called ERP. And then there is another one called product management. They have another IT system, and they are connected with a path. So this means they are not really integrated. And I don't know who can confirm that this is also applies to, to, to his internal company. Yeah, usually most people raise their hands. Or who, who would say our IT system is perfectly integrated, everything is working tightly, and we don't have a problem with, with data quality and integration? Yeah, nobody raises their hand, and that's my expectation. So um, we have more IT system, and next to the pathos, we also have some camps. Yeah? People send around Excel sheets, 
people use PowerPoint presentations. And this is the real world we usually have at the customer sites. And yeah, you see a lot of Excel sheets. Um, so what we do now, we take our data we have, and we import this data very easily in a graph. In this case, if it's like a relational table or a CSV file, it's easy. Uh, so, I, so, so I match identical things, and I put point them to the same node. And what I get out of this is a graph on the right side. And this graph, well, looks very interesting. And now, if I take different data sources into one huge graph, yeah, you see different colors are different sources. And then I connect this, the, the data using some keys. I have some logical keys. I get a huge graph in my database. And one powerful feature of Neo4j I mentioned before is I can find paths in between automatically. So if I start with a node on one data source, I can go to the total different end in the same graph and find all paths in between. I have a sample for that later. And this gives me a lot of possibilities to connect information that was not connected before. So what's the rough difference between a relational database and a graph database? As I said, relational databases are based on a mathematical model, model called set theory. Yeah, everybody in the ele elementary school has learned it. The Neo4j, or graph databases, based on a graph model. Um, by the way, Neo4j is a graph database. This means the internal representation of the data is nodes and a relationship. But this doesn't mean uh, that the user always sees graphs. Um, it's hidden. In the end, the normal end user application looks normal because in the end, a graph database is only a database. It stores data, it finds data, but in a much more elegant way than other databases do it. The basic concept of a relational database is a table. Here we have nodes. And a big difference is that relationships in a relational database are implicit foreign keys. Numbers here pointing to another number, I have to join them. Here, relationships are explicit own data type and, as I said, first class citizen. Query language, SQL, Cypher, you have seen a little bit of Cypher already. Um, both databases are transactional. Because I mention this because most new NoSQL databases tend to say, I don't need transactions. Neo4j is different. Yes, we are trans transactional. And I can talk to Neo4j using REST interfaces. So in the end, everything in the background, you can see this a little bit in the results set I have shown you before. You see, uh, just a second. You see here, the result is JSON. Yeah? Everything in the background of Neo4j is JSON. Now, um, so let's take a look on one specific example we have, a real world, fraud detection. We have a database full of users, bookings, flights, and now there we know some of those bookings are frauds. Yeah? And simply by taking a look in the graph, we have customers literally do, doing this, we can detect that some frauds, some of those are frauds. This is an example for a stolen user account because there is a booking for somebody else unknown to the system. Whereas on the right side, this is an example of a stolen credit card because the credit card was used with the user account, now it's used without. And it's very easy on the graph side now to see a fraud. And it's also very easy to have a, we can do a manual look or we can do a query against the database, which is relatively easy to formulate. And in the third step, we can train a neural network to detect our frauds automatically and give recommendations like, look, this is strange, this might be a fraud. And a human then confirms it and the network learns again, okay, this was not a fraud because this is okay, but here again is another fraud. So this very simple query can find relative complex business bookings, like comparing historical and current bookings. And in the end, we have an end user application telling me, look, here is a su suspicious booking. This might be a fraud. I also show the user historical bookings. so he can very easily decide if this is a fraud or not. And since our graph structure 
is very flexible, we also add potential frauds, frauds as a new node. Uh, this is a potential stolen credit card pointing for which the booking was made, what was the booking number, and which credit card was used. So I can store this directly in the graph. <coughs> we, as I said before, we store data internally in a graph, but we have seen the effect that end users are a little bit confused by a graph. So what we do is we present a graph, for example, as a hierarchy. So the end user can work in a hierarchy. Everybody is used to hierarchies uh, in the Explorer, you can open directories, which is a hierarchy. So we project a graph and we remove some redundancy in a hierarchy so the end users can understand it. And one short example of product management. We have one customer, um, Worldwide Active. They bought 50 local companies. And in this chemical industry, you have, or agrochemical industry, you have always the same thing which is sold in different countries with different product names. And we have taken all data we found and put into one large graph. And um, so we have connected everything. And then we can easily ask the system, what products do we offer in Denmark that treat brown rust on wheat? What, does our competitors, what do our competitors offer? Simply, we added all our competitors' data we found into one single database. So we are doing product management, comparing foreign products to our products. And now a real-world use case. What if glyphosate is forbidden in the European Union? And which of our products are affected? And this is an easy question, and it's easy following a path. Yeah? And um, another question would be, which alternative products do we have? And I have a small screenshot showing you exactly the result of this query. So I start left with the so-called active ingredient, which might be glyphosate. There is a formulation, there is a product, and in the middle, I, I find there is a, a treatment, so-called, which offers a specific treatment in Mexico, in this case, for a specific combination of a plant and a disease. And on the other hand, then I, f I continue in my graph on the other side and find products offering the same. You know, the green dots point to the same nodes in the middle. So I, and, uh, you must imagine the complete graph. We talk about millions of nodes. Yeah? So if I take a look manually on the graph, I don't do, do see anything. But I can tell in a single query, find me identical products which are based on different active ingredients. And I can use this for doing some business intelligence, like find me alternative products that we have to compensate for glyphosate. So this is very helpful for our, our customer. And here is an application we have done for the customer. You see, we are in Mexico. We talk about uh, potatoes. And um, the end user can see information like this. So we are taking a look on treatments. We have now growth stage number four of um, potatoes. You see there is a Spanish translation, which is specific for each plant and each growth stage, also stored in Neo4j. And then I'm clicking on objectivos, which are diseases. And I see, ref I see typical diseases that I might have on, on potatoes. And I see references to two products. And what happens behind this end user application, by the way, this is the application that was developed here in Belgrade mostly. Behind this end user front end, on the right side, this is the graph that is a result of the query. And people often ask, ask me, what is the, or what about performance if we are using a graph database? What about performance? And the result is very simple. If you have this kind of query, you get this graph as a result. The result of a graph database is a subgraph. Yeah? You see, we have nodes, we have relationships, we have millions of nodes altogether, but only, let's say, 100 or maybe only 30 are now relevant for us. And this result has no redundancy, because if you have a relational database and you're doing a query, you are getting a very wide table with a lot of redundancy. You need logic to remove redundancy. This is not required here. And for technical details, 
the result is a Java, uh, sorry, a JSON format. JSON contains a list of nodes and a list of relationships. So it's free of any redundancy. And we have persistence frameworks that create a Java object graph out of it. So we can work with it, just continue working in memory with this graph. And second, this result is one query and one response. If you have a relational database, either you get huge redundant tables, or you need up to 15 requests to the database to collect all data that you need to show on this page. And this works in a few milliseconds on a production machine. So the result is instant and very, very fast. So we have a good performance, not only because the database is optimized in storing graphical data, but also we get results complete in one response, which is very valuable to us. Another feature I have mentioned already, which is also very powerful, we have used it in our example for our um, search, is if I have data and I pick two nodes, we can tell Neo4j, tell me the path between those two nodes. Yeah? For example, how can I fly from Vienna to um, Los Angeles? It tells me you have first to fly, uh, it's Frankfurt, or then JFK or Mexico. I know this is uh, not real world data. And it will find me a path. This is one result type it can give me, a list of nodes and relationships fulfilling a path. And <coughs> we have some, I mentioned strategy before. Strategy, this is a huge, just a part of a huge graph for a company doing market research. And market research, so we have nodes that represent countries, companies, product, and market segments. And they are all connected. Those dat this data, by the way, is also crawled and uh, machine learning and connected automatically and keep kept update, yeah, up to date. So what we can do, they are interested in what has Apple to do with Germany, like a business question. And technically, what I'm doing here, I'm picking two nodes and telling Neo4j what is in between, the shortest path between two nodes. And this is the result. Yeah? Sorry if you cannot read it, but the answer is Apple is working on autonomous cars, which also BMW does, and BMW is a German company. Or Apple sold, uh, sells a product called iPhone 7, which is um, offered by Deutsche Telekom, which is a German company, and so on. Yeah? Like Apple is an electronic vendor, as it is uh, Mer uh, electronic components, as it is Mercedes, uh, and so on. So as you can see, this is of an extreme value. Yeah? I simply have all my facts in my database, and then I can simply pull nodes, and I get all that is connected in between. And this is a feature a relational database is unable to do for me. No? And as a last example here, everybody has heard of Panama Papers. No? You heard of, about Panama Papers? So they, they have their people and their companies and there are some accounts and strange data. And what the guys did, yeah? I mean, it was a huge boom when they came out with the facts. Technically, what have they done? They took everything in a Neo4j. Yeah? They took a, there's a front end on it. It's called Linkurious, which allows me to uh, traverse my graph without learning Cypher query language. And they have a huge graph. This is only a screenshot. Um, the complete data set is 2.6 terabytes. So they have a huge graph. And then you take out two persons and ask Neo4j what's in between. And then you can see, okay, he is a shareholder of this company and this company, and this company is a member of this company. And then you see, okay, what has person A to do with person B? And this is only possible with this kind of database. And one other example we are currently working on, we have some lawyers as customers. And what do lawyers have to do with this? You know, they have evidence, yeah, like Panama Papers. They have emails. And if you have some complex um, crime in, in the business world, you will win the law only if you can find information quickly. So for example, did he know a specific information before a specific date? 
and then we can take a graph, take the person, and take this information and see it was mentioned in an email which he received before. So we can prove he knew it. Yeah? So in future, trials will be won by the lawyers with the better IT system. And those IT systems need to use a data structure like this. Okay? So my timer was not running. I don't know how much time is left to summarize everything. And I think we have a short um, questions and answers session. So it's not only big data. As I said, big data is solved. We are able to process, we, we can store, we can process data. The complexity is getting higher. And as I mentioned before, if I have machine learning, I have probabilities, I can store this information in the relationships or in the nodes. And if I do some queries against the data, I can consider this probability because if I have a document telling me about vitamin B12 and it was found and I'm 90% sure, this is more worth than, than if I have a probability of only 30%. And I can have a single query considering everything I want and the database will me g give the most precise answer to it. Second, and I repeat it, the graph model is superior to any other data storage model we currently know and it's far superior than relational databases. And um, as I said, it's a challenge for us to handle this complex data. And my personal opinion is, in maybe five years, most new applications will be using graph databases as central database. And what happened 40 years ago that we suddenly had relational databases. Before that, we didn't have relational databases. We had some hierarchical or even non-relational databases. This is now happening again towards graph databases. So they will be coming very, very important. Yeah? And as I said, graphs contain semantics. And this semantic is what the user expects. Yeah? I am, I'm looking for a document, and it, the computer tells me, I don't have this. You know, you start searching million of entries. You, you refine it by one more word, 10,000. One more word, zero. And this is not what I want. I, don't, I want the I, this computer to tell me, look, I have something which is similar, this might be of interest to you. And this is my expectation, and this is also your expectation. And uh, you have seen a real-world example how it works. Um, yeah, and those relationships are the key we are talking about. And keys, I repeat, are the first-class citizen in the graph databases. And that's it. How much time do we have? We have, we have seven more minutes. Pardon? Seven more minutes, so... Uh yeah, and here we have one question, if you... Yeah, yeah. great. So, uh, yeah, the question is, uh, how, how did you kind of migrate uh, developers from thinking like relation to schema-less? And, yeah, how was your experience? For, uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> some, of, some guys here are from Prodyna, Serbia, and um, we started a new project, and I said, what technology to use? And four of five developers said, let's use Neo4j for it. So internally, we are very convinced to it. And um, people, when every time I come, come in and say, let's do a new Neo4j project, I hear people telling, hey, I would like to participate. I love using Neo4j. Because the reason is um, from a few technical details. Um, it's pure Java. I can, uh, if I'm using some microservices, for example, Spring Boot, I can launch Neo4j as part of my application, like an embedded database. It can run standalone, but the fact that I can run, it's very, it's very small. I can launch it in my process. I can do automated tests against uh, Neo4j. Um, if I'm doing a Maven project or, or um, Gradle, I have dependencies already existing in uh, Maven central repository, so I can very easily start with development. There is a huge community between it and very good support. So our developers are convinced and love Neo4j due to those facts and more. No? Okay, that's, that's all that I got from Chatbot. Um, maybe we have time now for a direct question. If you're shy to ask a bot, it's anonymous, so <laughs> don't worry. Here's one. Uh, I'll bring you. <coughs> Thank you. Well, uh, are there any data volume limitations in uh, this uh, database? Um, no. Um, I don't know. There is a technical limit, which are trillions of nodes, which are theoretically a maximum. I mean. Um, and the volume, the, the amount of data can be 
I don't know, there is no limitation that I know that in the histo historic versions of Neo4j, which are uh, version 2, had a limit of 4 million, sorry, billion nodes, yeah? which, uh, which is, uh, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but be aware, um, there, um, um, it is capable of doing big data, but if you have stupid data, which like logs or sensor data, um, which cannot be interconnected to a graph, which are simply nodes in the, in the space, not connected, Neo4j doesn't make sense. And in this case, um, I personally prefer using a combination of Neo4j for doing the semantical stuff, plus a database like, um, let's say, MongoDB or, um, or um, Cassandra, for example, for storing this mass data. And then there is a logical reference. And then you use things like Spring Boot, Spring Data, and Spring Data Neo4j and Spring Data Cassandra, for example. Okay. So this is my opinion, but hard, there is no gener generic answer to it. We have, we have production environments with Neo4j with billions of nodes, okay? But there again, it's big server, 64 cores, one terabyte of RAM, and so on. Yeah? Big data, big machine, yeah? May I ask, uh, sorry, uh, one minute more. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you're using in analytics purposes uh, Neo4j. And uh, uh, could you please explain how you use it directly or you process, uh, post-process data after Neo4j, or how, how, how you establish that? You talk about this one on the yeah, early slide. I mean, and what, what we are doing, we, are, um, um, the, we have different kind of analytics. Um, we are doing an analytics before and mostly using Neo4j as the final store of our facts. So we collect facts in the database. For example, if we are collecting sensor data, we don't need to store every single sensor data. Therefore, we use something like Cassandra. But the fact that there is a, um, um, let's say, a high watermark, and we passed it, and we went again down, those facts are stored in, in the Neo4j, because this is what we, in the end, want to know. Um, if we, there are connectors from Tableau, which can talk directly to Neo4j. So we can represent this in the end for Neo4j. And what is new for this um, analytics is to take a look on the graph and find new relationships um, by looking on the existing graph. So this is kind of a new processing. So we have multiple steps and multiple locations where we refine our data. Is your question answered? We have a booth here, Prodina. And if anybody wants to talk um, about Neo4j, have questions, different opinions, I'm open for any discussion. Feel free to come to our booth and talk to me. I speak English, German, and uh, Serbian with a Croatian accent. One more. One more. Uh, how does Neo4j scale? You mentioned that you run billions of nodes <coughs> on a very fast machine. Uh, is it possible to run it on a multiple slower machines? Uh, yes, Neo4j can cluster. Neo4j has an open source version. It's uh, the community edition, and there is an enterprise uh, version. And this enterprise version can run in a cluster, and you can have multiple nodes, and the nodes uh, are independent. Um, so you can, uh, everybody can do read operations on the same time. And I think there's currently one limitation that only one node can write. So what you can do is you, you have a multiple nodes. Um, you have a load balancer, which is a REST and a proxy, like AHA proxy. And it does a round robin over all machines, so you can scale out on Neo4j. But one limitation, each cluster member has a full copy of the graph. Neo4j has no possibility of doing some kind of sharding. This has to do with the fact that there is no logical kind how you separate a graph in multiple pieces. But on the other hand, Neo announced that future versions will support any kind of uh, sharding. So this means every node instance will have to have the full copy. So if you have one terabyte of data, you have to have one terabyte on all machines. OK? Question answered? OK. That's it. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank Darko. You this, was, this was good. So don't forget to rate him. Well, I expect only the best. And as I said,